ideals, a lot of things that they can say, uh, a lot of ideals about what's to happen, what's going to happen, these different things in the Scripture. But an ideal about something is not what the Scripture is actually saying. The Bible teaches us this. I think it was 1 Corinthians, seemed like. Let me look over here at my Scriptures and see if that's where it was, make sure. It's 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, 17, 18, 19, says... Paul was talking about that when he preached Christ, it was not yea and nay. It wasn't one thing and then the opposite of it. And another place, the Bible said that God is not the author of confusion. Now, these things are interesting. And I want to take a message of William Branham. Now, I could take messages of other denominations and go through several things. Because whatever that a church teaches, you'll find out that if it's an error, there's a lot of errors. There's a lot of things that contradict the Scriptures. Now, a lot of people talk about deception and things, but the truth is, if you're in deception, you don't know it. And the only way you would know it is if God would reveal it to you. Uh, it's not something that I can open up to you. I can tell you I have a revelation about something, but that don't mean that uh, you've got that same revelation. I recently contacted a minister in this message, one of the only two that's ever responded to me out of the dozens of so that I've seen of ministers, lay people, asking them to answer questions about what's called the message, R. William Branham. Uh, they just won't. The answer this last minister gave me, and he has a really large congregation and uh, what he calls a missionary work in the Philippines and missionary work in the prisons, and he has, I guess, thousands of people that uh, he's influencing through his ministry of giving them books and tapes and different things of William Brown. I questioned him about some of the things said that doesn't seem to be Scripture. His answer was what, whether they say it or not, is every message minister. If you've got a message minister, he's a pastor, this is his answer. We can't understand the Scriptures. He said that uh, God sent us a prophet because we don't have the ability to understand the scriptures. That's scary to me because people have given their life, have been burned at the stake and killed, imprisoned, trying to give the people the scriptures so they can read it for themselves. The Catholic Church teaches this, and this is reading that I've read. It's not my ideal. They teach for a long time that uh, no one was to have a Bible. And if you did have a Bible, I could show you where it was their counsels they had. You were to bring the Bible, the Scriptures, Old and New Testament, to them so they could be burned. Uh, your teaching was to come from the priest or the Pope. When Mr. Ty Tyndale, I believe is his name, and others got the Bible out uh, in English, and Luther, of course, helped in the German, then the Catholics said, okay, you've got the Bible, but you can only translate it according to what the Catholic Church has translated it. In other words, if they say the Eucharist is the literal body of Christ, you are not allowed to go against that, as it tells us in the book of St. John. And that teaching goes back, of course, to Catholicism where how it began in the beginning in order to keep confusion out of the church. They didn't think any individual should have the right to study the Bible and understand it. And that's what I come out of and what many, many religions, most religions that way, matter of fact, they may not say it, but uh, if a, someone in a congregation begins to question, what do, you teach this, what does this mean? And it's different what the pastor thinks. They'll just let you know right quick they're the pastor. Or else they'll do as I, my pastor, used to be pastor, told me, he's leave. If you can't agree with me, leave. Um, but God don't give revelation just to a preacher. Uh, a preacher, he leads a preacher in the Word of God to teach what the Word says, not the meaning of the Word. Now, I can tell you Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, but that'll do you no good at all, none, zero, unless God reveals to you that it was for you. 
That's a revelation. And I've got a message of William Branham. I can put it up here where you can look at it and read it if you want to. But uh, And maybe I will just, uh, if you excuse me for turning my head for a moment, to show you the notes. And you can kind of look at them here and uh, see uh, some things William Branham said. I thought I'd bring it to your attention that if you would look at it, he makes a lot of statements. And it's really, I don't know how we could uh, say it any different or make it any different, but uh, he tells us that after the third chapter, and sometimes he'd say the fourth chapter of the book of Revelations, that the church is gone and everything else is to Israel. He tells us that not one time and not in this message out of God for it's called the uh, Feast of the Trumpets, but he tells us many times that after the third and fourth chapter, it's not to the Gentiles. He tells us that so many times, I, I can't even count them, uh, but I'd say dozen or dozens. And then <clears throat> you read what he says about that, and he says, as he talks about the uh, Feast of the Trumpets, that they're not to the Gentiles at all, they're all to the Jews. Uh, then he brings out this statement here. You notice that it only says on about verse 62, John the Baptist was not the Elijah of Malachi 4. He was the Elijah of Malachi 3. Now, I don't know. If you read your Bible, most people. I find in Pentecostal churches, Pentecostal type churches, that most people are influenced by emotion and the way the preacher preaches more than actually what he's saying. I know there's a very, uh, what I, I want to say, well-favored minister in the message down close to uh, Kingsport, Tennessee, where I used to minister. And uh, he was preaching one time, and people was going on what a great message it had been, how they enjoyed it, and I listened to it. And I asked the people, what did he say? What did he teach? And none of them could answer one time I listened to a preacher preach there at that same church, uh, 300 people or more there, and he was quoting and saying things that was not Scripture and was not even what William Branham taught. And the people were just hollering and shouting and saying, oh, this, this is so wonderful that uh, this message is just so great. And they were just talking about how great it was. Well, you know, that same pastor invited me to preach in a little bit. And I did, and I had those notes, and I wanted to correct that preacher. I didn't say I was correcting him. I just said the opposite, very different than what he said. Absolutely uh, 180 degrees opposite of what he taught. You know, those people were standing and shouting at me and hollering amen, and that's right, and glory to God. And, uh, it really got me upset. So I, I stopped and looked at that large congregation. I said, you don't know what you're shouting about. You don't understand when people preach, the way they preach, the emotion, the way they bring it across. So that's more influence than what you're saying. You know, Jesus never run up and down the hills and hollered and carried on and raised his hands up there and uh, carried on to get to people's attention. One of the greatest messages he ever spoke was about this day the scripture is fulfilled. I'm sure you've all read it. And he says in that message, though, he's sitting down. He sat down. He talked to people. Most of Christ's message was just speaking to the people words. Uh, those words cut into the people's lives and hearts. It made them angry. When you hear the truth, it'll either make you angry or it'll cause you to repent, one of the two. There's many things that William Branham teaches that I don't know if I could go through all this, but just like saying John the Baptist was the Elijah of Malachi 3. You mention that to a message person, they'll say, well, I know what he meant. Well, yeah, I'm sure you think you do. Uh, just like Jesus said, a prophet is only a son of man, means a prophet. Look up that in the Bible. There's probably over 100 places I'm a son of man. You're a son of man. Uh, every person born is a son, in this world, is a son of man. 
every person, not just prophets. It is true, prophets are called son of man. Jesus was called son of man, and he was, because he was born of a woman. But anyway, that, that's just one thing. Uh, <clears throat> another thing he taught in the Feast of the Trumpets, uh, let's go over that again, if you allow me. It says this, uh, down about right here. It says, he never referred to himself as son of God. Now, that's very strange that a prophet in contact with God, an angel talking to him, would make a statement that the Bible plainly says is not correct. Well, what do you mean? Well, just read what Jesus said here in John 9.35, if you will. Uh, let's see that a little, back it up a little bit. John 9, 30, Jesus heard they cast him out, and when he found him, this is a man that was healed of blindness, I believe. He said, Does thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, Thou hast seen him, and it is he that talketh to him. John ten thirty six, Say you him whom the Father has sanctified and set in the world, thy blasphemous, because I said, I am the Son of God. Look at you say John 11 and 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, that This sickness not in the death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So what is correct? Do you believe the Bible, or perhaps do you believe William Branham? It's kind of... I can't say it upsets me, but it does upset me. When people will take the words of any man, any man, not just William Branham, but any man, and say, this is what is truth, this is what I believe, and, and walk over the Bible. Just absolutely walk over the Bible. I don't know how to make it any different. It's just, uh, it's amazing to me that those things can happen. He talks about the trumpets here. Uh, he talks about the sixth trumpet, under the sixth trumpet, there was 200,000 horsemen. I could give you many things down there that William Branham said in the Feast of the Trumpets. For instance, he said, every trumpet that's loosed was loosed on the Jews under the sixth seal. And uh, notice what he says here on paragraph 161. He says, under that sixth trumpet, they were loosed on the Jews, the persecution of the Jews, supernatural devils, 2,000 years, loosed by Stalin, Hitler upon the Jews. That's under what? The sixth trumpet. Now go back to the statement he made a little earlier, if you will. And that's just one statement that he made that uh, there's nothing after the fourth chapter, third chapter of Revelations has anything to do with the church. It's all to the Jews. Well, now he's talking about the sixth trumpet there is already sounded. And it sounded and the Jews were persecuted back in 1941 to 45. That's exactly right. Now, that's really strange, isn't it? Uh, loosed upon the Jews. Let's go back to those notes again and look at them again, if you will. Notice he says they were loosed on the Jews who do nothing of the Spirit. The trumpet here, the last trumpet, these trumpets are loosed on the Jews. But he, he's, he's telling you, look, they're already loosed. Uh, it happened in 1940 and 45. He goes on to tell these different things, uh, what would happen. So <clears throat> if you'll read uh, here in verse 242, notice it. He says, under the sixth trumpet, the Pentecostals reject the Bible. Now, whoa. How did the Pentecostals reject the Bible under the sixth trumpet when there's nothing after the fourth chapter that has anything to do with the bride? Uh, not only the Pentecostals, but the rest, he says. The church world rejects Christ. He's put it outside on the same trumpet and the same seal. Now, what's the same seal? I, I don't know. Maybe it means six. Uh, I don't know. And you don't either. You'd have to guess at it and try to figure it out. You don't know whether he means the sixth trumpet or the sixth seal or what it was. Uh, <clears throat> here again uh, on... Paragraph 246, he said, Pentecost finished the period of the seventh trumpet. Next is the seventh seal. The next is the coming of Christ. So he's always taught the seventh seal is the coming of Christ. Uh, here he says, Pentecost feast, this is to the Jews, finishes at the period of the seventh trumpet. And then next is the seventh seal, the coming of Christ. 
If now if that's not confusion, tell me what is confusion. You got the uh, trumpet finishing Pentecost finishes at the seventh trumpet, and the next is the seventh seal. So you got the trumpet sounding before the coming of Christ. It's really confusion to me, see. The trumpet's for the Jews. Six trumpet is sounded. It makes known to them the revealed sound of God, he says. I, I don't know what he means by that. One and a half hour space. But then again, he teaches that one hour space is the coming of Christ to the Gentiles. And remember, he says the sixth trumpet was sounded in 1940 to 45 when Stalin and Hitler and all those persecuted the Jews. Now that happened. I don't deny that. But was that the sixth trumpet? See, I, I don't know. They're just... And he, he mentions that again. It's not just a, a slip of the tongue. He mentions it right here in verse 248. Notice that. Uh, the trumpet, persecution under Hitler and them. The trumpet back in 1940-45. The Jews was forced to come together to fulfill scriptures. Uh, I go into that a lot too, but you see what he's get at there. Then he comes back and says, the trumpets mean nothing to us. They all sounded under our sixth seal. Now, if you know much about the message or come out of the message or studying the message at all, you'll know this. And he says this more than once than that, that the sixth seal is a seal of persecution. Now, that's, uh, and he says many times, the church is gone when the sixth seal opens. But here he says the sixth trumpet, the persecution of the Jews, happened uh, under the sixth seal. So this is really confusion to me. And it would be to anybody that wants to just look at the truth. You'll be confused if you'll try to take any of the messages of William Branham and make it work and operate according to the scriptures. It just can't be done. So I, I don't know uh, how to explain it any better. I'll go back to these notes and look at it. I can go on and on about them. There's just so many things in there that we look at. <clears throat> he says here from the seventh seal, from the seventh angel's message of the seventh seal. Now remember, he just told you that the trumpet sound under the sixth seal. And here he called in the seventh angel message of the seventh seal message in Revelation 10 was the seventh seal. Uh, he says between those times, between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, and he says the sixth trumpet and the sixth seal sound at the same time, and between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet, there's a prophet appear before the Gentile. Now we're over in the book of Revelation, which he said over a dozen times. Those things have nothing to do with the Gentiles. Here you've got the sixth seal sounding, which is when the sun turns dark and every mountain, <laughs> all it's moved. And he says after that, the sixth trumpet sounds, then there's a message to the Gentiles. So it makes sense out of that, people. If you're a message believer, you can't. You're in delusion if you keep following this stuff. You're going to be lost. Uh, the Bible tells us the man of sin, everybody thinks, well, some days going to be a man of sin. Listen, there's men of sin sits in the pulpit every week and lies to the people sitting out there. Some people are getting rich by it. Some people are getting a following by it. But I don't deny there'll be a man of sin. I don't know. But as far as the deceived world, how much more deceived can you get than what the world is today? Uh, everybody believes something different. Well, you know, I, I was talking to a friend about the Azusa Street. Uh, I don't believe that was a restoration of the gifts. I'm not sure what it was. Do you believe the Holy Ghost fell on people? Yes. Do you believe people were healed? Absolutely. Uh, I believe people were converted. But everyone in Azusa Street that got converted, wherever they went, whatever they done, they all came to the knowledge of what is truth, which is the Bible. Those things that come out of Azusa Street and form Church of God of Christ and Church of God and Assembly of God and United Pentecostal, uh, the Holy Ghost don't lead people different ways. It leads them to one way, and that is to what the Scripture says. 
And when you come to what the Scripture says, everyone that has the Holy Ghost will agree on that. Somebody, you know, uh, we've got, well, speaking in tongues is a evidence of the Holy Ghost. Well, actually, it's not. Because I know a lot of people that speak in tongues in church and have <clears throat> claimed to have the Holy Ghost, but you watch their life and what they believe. They, they didn't have the Holy Ghost. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it's just all this the truth. I hope this is helping you some way. Let's go and look at a couple other things. I, I could speak for a long time, but maybe I'll come back and do a little more. I want to go on down to the bottom here to something he says, and uh, <clears throat> where he says, you know, notice I got that there, I think. Uh, he talks about the two witnesses, if we can find them there, the two servants appear on the scene to sound the seventh trumpet. Now, I didn't put the scripture down, uh, but they were taken up, I don't think I did. Yeah, there it is. Verse 11, Revelation 11 and 12 says this, They heard a great voice from heaven saying to them, Come up hither. Now here are the two prophets. They've left. Then after they leave, it says the seventh angel sounded. So how did they sound the seventh trumpet if they're already in heaven? See, it just don't make sense, folks. Uh, I'm going to close when we read this here. He talks about we'll be guided back to the original Pentecostal faith. Question answers. He says it many times, many places. He says, uh, the apostle faith, you stay at the Bible. That's apostolic faith today. Uh, many of them don't stay at the Bible. Apostolic means apostolic faith, the apostolic faith of the Bible. On anointed ones, he said, uh, we'll walk where the apostles have trod. Now, how do we apply these quotes? After he taught that, his whole message on based on restoring the faith, then he comes along and says something like in Shalom and the visible union of bride. What's he say? He says, the word in the days of the apostles what Paul preached, Peter preached, James preached, and all the other apostles preached won't work today. In Invisible Union, he's, he brings it this, the word that fell on the day of Pentecost, and that was repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You shall receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He says that will work. He says the Pentecost represented that. Well, if that doesn't tell you you're in trouble if you believe that message. I don't know how to get it across. You know, people won't take the Bible. The Bible teaches if you can find one prophecy that failed, you're not to pay attention to that man. You get away from him. And if he it actually tells us that if he points you to something inside the Scripture, uh, the Word of God and some other God, and you are worshiping some other God if you're not worshiping the, the God of eternity by the Scripture. You're worshiping an error. You're following the tradition of a man. So what can I say? Get out of those things. I don't care what church you're in. You may be listening to this. You may go to a Baptist or some other church. That's fine. God can deal in any church he wants to. That's up to him. I certainly believe he called me in a Baptist church. But you won't stay in a church that teaches error. If you're a child of God, some way you'll start reading your Bible and realize there's more to it than what I'm hearing behind this pulpit. And you will be led. It might be a two-day journey. It might be a 40-year journey. But you will be led to all truth because the Holy Ghost has promised to lead and guide you to all truth. Well, God bless you. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. I hope you get something out of this. I hope that uh, you'll be blessed by it. Uh, I don't have my email down there, but it's Joe Heflin, J-O-E-H-E-F-F-L-I-N at gmail.com if you want to, or you can put a comment on this uh, YouTube, we'll be fine. Thank you for listening, and may the Lord bless you.